end. So let's get started and visit with Ryan in our laboratory in St. Petersburg. Hi, Ryan. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Moyer and I am joining you live from our Coastal Wetlands Laboratory here at the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Petersburg. I'm going to quickly introduce you to our team and then um, I'm going to show a short video and then I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we use while we're walking through a coastal wetland and uh, trying to understand the ecology that's happening there. So hopefully everyone can see this. Um, this is just a quick introduction. My name is Ryan Moyer. I'm an associate research scientist here at um, the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and I lead the Coastal Wetlands Research Program. I'm joined in the lab today by Savannah Hearn, who's a Fish and Wildlife Technician. And we also have on the call with us Dr. Kara Radabaugh, who's an assistant research scientist with the program. Scott Adams is our biological scientist. He is out in the field today and we're hoping to maybe get a check in with him in the field, but we're not sure if the technology is going to work for that. And uh, another key team member is Emily Ritz, who's another fish and wildlife um, technician in the program. Savannah and I are wearing masks because we're in close quarters and we still need to follow all of our safety guidance, but hopefully you can hear me OK. I'm going to switch over to a short video. Coastal wetlands in Florida include salt marshes and mangrove forests. These wetlands are found next to oceans or estuaries such as Tampa Bay. They're flooded at high tide, but the ground is exposed at low tide. Mangroves and salt marshes are home to a lot of animals such as crabs, oysters, snakes, birds, and sometimes larger animals like raccoons and alligators. A lot of fish live near coastal wetlands when they're young as the plants give them a safe place to hide from predators. In the Coastal Wetlands Research Lab at FWC, we study the plants, water, and soil in mangroves and salt marshes. The plants in coastal wetlands are unique because they can grow in salt water. While mangroves grow close to the water's edge, salt marsh grasses are found further away from the water. However, sea levels are slowly rising, which makes it hard for these plants to grow in their current places. We study how mangroves and salt marshes are slowly moving further inland as sea levels rise. Because the soil in coastal wetlands is often flooded by salt water, it doesn't have any oxygen below ground. The bacteria that grow without oxygen can make the soil smell like rotten eggs. Mangroves and salt marshes grow a lot of roots that don't decompose quickly because there's no oxygen below ground. These roots and falling leaves can add soil over time and slowly increase the height of the forest floor. We put layers of white clay in the forest, then come back a year later to see how much soil has been added on top. If these wetlands can make enough soil, they may be able to stay in place even as sea level rises. We also take cores of soil from coastal wetlands and analyze the soil in the lab. We can tell how much sand or plant matter is found in the soil. We do this by burning off the plant matter in a special oven that can reach very high temperatures. The amount of weight lost tells us how much plant matter is in the soil. Working in coastal wetlands can be challenging as we work through all kinds of weather and walk through lots of mud. It's hard to walk through a wetland, but we're excited to share more about our research in mangroves and salt marshes with you today. Okay, and hopefully we are back live um, in the laboratory. So I wanted to go over um, a few of the tools that we use while we're out there walking through our coastal wetlands um, to try to understand what's going on with these important habitats in Florida. And so um, we're usually carrying, and hopefully you saw in the video that uh, we're, we're usually carrying these uh, waterproof backpacks that um, house all of our gear. And the first thing we need is some important safety gear. There's lots of mosquitoes out there, and so we want to protect ourselves from mosquito bites. And so we have these head nets that keep our head safe. Notice I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. We always wear long pants. I've got some pretty heavy boots on. Um, we need to have the right safety gear to be able to walk through these coastal wetlands so that we are protected. And that includes the proper headwear so that we wear these funny looking mosquito nets. Um, we also sometimes carry bug spray, but that's really cheating. We, we uh, try to keep the bug spray to a minimum. Um, we also want to protect our hands and depending on the methods that we use, um, we have a couple of different types of gloves that we use. So we need to protect our hands with gloves. I'm going to put these on. 
All right, now we're ready to do our science. We've got ourselves protected, and we've, um, we're ready to go. So um, one of the things we often do is to mark the area that we're working, and to do that, we use a transect tape. And in the video, you would have seen a few scientists uh, working along a transect. And so we have these tape measures that we put out. They're really, really long. Um, some of them are like 150 feet long, and, um, and sometimes we work longer distances than that, but we use these tape measures to um, mark out the boundary of the plots that we're working in or the transects that we're um, surveying across while we're out there in the wetland. Then once we get out there, it's really important to know uh, where we are, and we have a couple of tools to help us with this. We use handheld GPSs so we can mark the location that we're working in, and we can come back. And uh, so there's a close-up view of the handheld GPS. I don't have it turned on because we're in a building and it won't get good signal, but that's what these things look like. Um, this will give us a good idea of where we're working, and so we can go back and revisit the sites many times uh, over the years. We also have more sophisticated GPS technology, um, and this is what we call a real-time kinematic GPS system, and this can help us not just measure uh, the latitude and longitude of where we're working to very high precision, but it also measures the elevation of the site. So we can actually look at um, changes in elevation and um, how sea level rise, which you heard about in the video, is affecting our coastal wetland systems. So this is another heavy piece of equipment that we always have to carry when we're walking through our coastal wetlands. Once we've got our plots established and we know where we are, then we want to understand um, what the trees uh, look like. And there's two main ways that we do this. We assess the um, canopy cover, so how much, um, how much, uh, leaf overhang there is in the canopy above the trees and we have two tools to do this one looks like a pirate compass um, but it tells us about canopy density and the other one kind of looks like a periscope on a submarine and also tells us about canopy density and so with these tools you look through them and hopefully um, if you can see here this has a mirror in it and if i wiggle my fingers up here maybe you can see that but instead of um, looking at my hand you would be looking at um, how much how many leaves are um, above your head in the canopy um, this pirate compass works in very much the same way it's actually called a, a spherical densiometer not a pirate compass but it looks a lot like a pirate compass um, you look at this and the reflection in this you can see up into the canopy and you can actually count there's actually a grid on there and you can count uh, how much coverage there is of uh, of leaves uh, within the gridded area of this um, this mirrored lens so those are two ways that we assess the trees above our heads on the ground we have a um, a special kind of ruler it's a it's a tape measure, but it's calibrated so that you can wrap it around the trunks of trees and tell the size of the tree, tell the diameter of the tree trunk. Because um, if we just try to do that with a ruler and you try to lay it flat, the ruler doesn't bend around the tree. So we use this special tape um, that's got markings on both sides and it's got a hook um, on this end so that you can um, hook it onto the tree and then wrap it around the tree and you can tell the size of the tree. So those are two of the um, basic measurements we make on the trees when we're in a mangrove forest. We also want to understand um, what the what the soil composition is below ground and whether these systems are healthy enough to be creating soil that can help them keep pace with sea level rise and things like that. So to do that, we have this tool here um, it kind of looks like a big sword, but this is um, this helps us collect a core. And so we put this down into the soil, you spin it, and then what comes out in this barrel right here is a core section 
of um, mangrove or marsh peat. And once we collect the sample using, and that's called a Russian peat pourer, once we collect the sample, we put it in a PVC sleeve like this. We take it right out of the um, right out of the coring device, put it in a PVC sleeve like this. This is an empty one. You can see how dirty it is. It did have um, that stinky mangrove and marsh soil in it before, but um, this is what one of the cores looks like once we bring it into the laboratory. It's um, it's covered in saran wrap so that the core stays in the tube, um, but hopefully you can see that it's, it's got this dark peat material in there. We always mark the top and the bottom of the core so we know which way was up after we collect the sample. Um, so that helps us assess the health of the uh, coastal wetlands below ground. I haven't yet mentioned the most important pieces of equipment. And when you're out there collecting data, it's really important to write everything down. And so we always bring a big baggie of pens and pencils and markers. Um, but as you can imagine, and if you can see with our field book, how muddy and dirty these things get um, because of all that wonderful mud that's out there in the coastal wetlands. We actually need to use special kinds of paper um, to be able to take our notes. And we have, uh, this is a, what a typical data sheet might look like. And we have a special kind of paper here that lets us use pencils. And this paper, you can actually write on it underwater. Um, and so I'm gonna demonstrate that back here. I don't know how well you can see um, this far into the lab, but I put the paper into a bucket of water. I'm going to get a pencil. And I'm going to write on it. Now that's still that's still dripping wet and you couldn't do that with a regular piece of paper. I don't know if you can see I'm going to drip right on my laptop here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you can see that, but we write on that with a pencil. And so in any weather conditions and even in the thickest mud, we can actually write on this paper to collect our data. Um, so those are some of the uh, many tools that we use to study these things in the field. But then, of course, once we collect all of this information, we have to come into the laboratory. Um, and so, for instance, things like this, uh, this core sample here, we bring it to the laboratory, uh, we slice it up, and Savannah's going to show you a few of the techniques. I'll talk through it as she shows you um, the things that we use to analyze these cores. So one of the things we do is we cut these into uh, one centimeter slices and then we um, and then we actually uh, burn them in an oven to determine how much carbon is in them. And the oven is in the back of the lab. Savannah's gonna put on all of her safety gear. So just like we needed safety gear in the field, Savannah's going to put on safety gear in the laboratory, including eye protection. She's put some gloves on. She's about to put a lab coat on. Notice she's also wearing long sleeves and long pants. Now we're protected. And so we take these cores, we slice them up, we put them in the oven and we measure the weights before we put them in the oven and after we put them in the oven. And that tells us um, a little bit about the chemistry of the core. So this is what one of those trays looks like. Maybe she can bring you a crucible and show it close in the camera. So we put them in those little um, ceramic crucibles just like that. And then when they come out of the oven, they get weighed on a balance. And that's what Savannah is doing now. If you can see that far into the laboratory. And so we determine the weight. We record the weights of all of these crucibles. And um, we do this at two different temperatures. We we bake these cores at really high temperatures, 550 degrees C and 950 degrees C. Um, Michelle, do we have Scott on the line or was he not able to get in? We're, we're, we were going to try to check in and tell you about some of the other work we do in wetlands. Um, and we have one of our lab members that's out in the field 
but we weren't sure if we could get um, get him let's, live. Let's, let's call let's him call in right him. now. OK, we're going to try to call him and see if we can call him in from the field. And if we can, he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the oyster work that we do in Tampa Bay. If we can't get him in. I will just tell you about it. And Savannah is going to show you how we actually count um, our oysters. We can't get Scott. Maybe we could FaceTime him. <laughs> well, <laughs> the uh, Teams app on the phone doesn't enable presenter view, only attendee view. OK. All right, so uh, it looks like the technology is not going to allow us to check in in the field, which is unfortunate. We have someone out in the field who's um, uh, monitoring oysters, and oysters are an, or an organism that lives in coastal wetland habitats or adjacent to coastal wetland habitats. And besides monitoring marshes and mangroves, we also do a lot of oyster monitoring uh, in the laboratory. And so Savannah's got some oyster shells that she can show you. And we deploy um, old oyster shells out into the bay and we uh, actually hang them on trees uh, made out of PVC and wire. And then we let little baby oysters settle on the old shells and then we bring those shells back to the lab and using this um, magnifying glass. So that is showing you now how we examine the shells and we count how many new baby oysters have settled on a shell in an area. And that tells us how healthy the oyster population is adjacent to our coastal wetlands, to our marshes and our mangroves. Um, so those are some of the um, things that we do when we're out there walking through these coastal wetlands. And these are uh, some of the techniques that we use in the laboratory after we have collected our samples in the field and bring them back to the laboratory. I think that is all we had to uh, show you in the lab and we would be happy to take uh, any questions and we can kick that back over to Michelle for questions. And I'm going to take my there's no mosquitoes in here, so I'm going to I'm going to keep my mask on, but take my mosquito um, net off. Hey everybody, Ryan, thanks so much for showing us and Savannah, thanks so much for showing us all these different research methods um, that are useful to studying coastal wetland habitats. Um, so let's pull up. We have some great questions here. Um, let's see. Sorry, that was. OK, so here we have our questions. Um, start at the top here. So while watching that video, somebody asked, why are the roots so long? Are we muted? Let's see. Let's make sure if you go, if you enable audio at the top, it should be enabled. It should be good. OK. Um, and OK, so why are the roots so long? So while they were looking at mangroves, um, somebody was wondering why are those roots so long? So that's a really good question and that um, is one of the most difficult things about walking out in the coastal wetland is that the mangroves have these really long roots that we call prop roots. And because of um, the soil characteristics, uh, sometimes they have very low oxygen in the roots and so they actually have these roots that are above ground that help them do gas exchange um, above the water surface. And so red mangroves particularly, and those long roots are associated with a type of mangrove that we call red mangroves in Florida. Um, those roots are um, to help them basically breathe because the conditions below the water surface and in the soil sometimes are not, um, not conducive to um, photosynthesis and respiration. Very interesting. Thanks for the good question. Um, there's a lot of questions about have you ever encountered dangerous animals? Have you ever stepped on a snake or got bitten by a snake or seen an alligator or a crocodile? There's a lot of those types of questions. Have you guys ever seen an alligator, crocodile or snake out there before? 
Yes, 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 and yes. Um, <laughs> all of those things and more. Um, so the oysters that I mentioned, these shells are really sharp and they can, they can cut you. That's why we wear protective gloves and boots. Um, we have definitely seen alligators, usually just from the boat. If we see one in the water, we try to get back up on the boat. Um, fortunately, most of the systems we work in are very, um, very much salt water. And so the alligators usually don't come in too much. But um, when we work down in the Everglades in the Florida Keys, we have seen crocodiles before. Um, and the crocodiles look mean, but they, they kind of stay away too, usually. Um, we have some field sites down in the Keys where we get little baby sharks that swim up to us. They're, they're not big sharks, but they're just little baby sharks that, um, that swim up to us. Um, we have definitely seen a lot of snakes well, one thing most people don't realize is that the mangroves are just full of spiders and spider webs and these big, big spiders uh, that live in the mangrove. So we see all kinds of uh, creatures that uh, fortunately no one has ever been seriously uh, injured or, uh, or chased by any of these creatures. But yeah, they're really interesting when we see them. And that's why all of that safety equipment is so important so you can protect yourself while you're out there and doing science. Um, so another question about animal encounters. Have you seen any weird or rare animals? Any weird or rare animals? Um, no, not usually. Um, I mean, it's pretty rare to see a shark or something like that, but every now and again we do. Um, some of the species of birds that we see are more rare than others. Um, we always like to see roseated spoonbills, the nice bright pink birds um, that many people mistake for flamingos. Um, those are nice to see. Um, but no, most of the, we don't usually see too many rare uh, birds. I wish we could see a panther sometime, but we've never seen a panther before, so. <laughs> Um, how much soil do you collect for a sample? That's a good question. That is a great question. So this, and that's something you probably couldn't tell on the video, this length here is 50 centimeters. Um, in some cases, and it depends on our scientific research question, sometimes that's all we need. It's just the top 50 centimeters of soil. Um, other research applications, we collect down to one meter or three feet of soil. Um, so that's two of these tubes. And then I have collected, um, there are some places in Florida where we have these really, really deep deposits of soil. And I have personally collected um, continuous cores down to eight meters in length. Um, so that's multiply eight times three for those of, this is a, a quick math quiz for those of you out there. If you multiply eight times three, you'll get the number in feet. I'm not going to give away the answer. You got to do it yourself. <laughs> it's 24. No. Um, <laughs> eight but, times three uh, is 24. So I've, that's that's a long continuous core. That's over 20 feet of uh, continuous soil. So we have collected anywhere from a foot and a half, which is what this is, to between 20 and 25 feet of um Wow, that's a lot of soil and I'm sure you can see all the different layers in there too. Yeah, you can. And so that's one of the things we look for is different layers of soil and each layer. So um, the older material is at the bottom and the younger material is at the top. And we have we have taken radiocarbon ages of the deepest cores that are that are 20 feet long and they are uh, between five and six thousand years old at the very bottom. Wow. Meanwhile, the soil at the top um, was just deposited maybe last week um, or the day that we collected the core. Very interesting. We can learn so much about habitats by just looking at the soil. Um, we have several other questions here and we have three minutes left. Um, so let's see. What types of things do you look at under the microscope? What types of things do we look at under the microscope? Most of the work that we do is just looking at uh, under the microscope is, um, and it's not even the microscope, it's really just a magnifying glass, um, is looking at uh, the oysters that settle on our old shells. So just looking for baby oysters. Um, we do have some colleagues that we collaborate with that look at um, 
what they call microfossils under the microscope in some of these um, in some of these soil samples. And um, sometimes we actually look at the composition and you can tell roots and you can tell leaf parts and you can tell other things that uh, actually make up this soil. So sometimes we look for those things under the microscope as well. Very cool. Um, and why do baby oysters settle on old oyster shells? That's a great question. They need a hard substrate to settle on and old oyster shells. Uh, most things like to settle on the sort of the shells that make them. Corals do this. They settle on old coral skeletons. Oysters do this. They settle on old oyster shells naturally. Um, so many things that uh, that build reefs, including oysters, like to settle on the material that they they make their shells out of. That's that provides the best uh, chemistry uh, basically for them to settle on. They can't settle in soft mud. That's that's um, it would it would basically smother the oyster. And so they need a hard surface. They will settle on. They prefer to settle on shell, but they can settle on mangrove. Those those long mangrove roots that somebody else asked about earlier, they can settle on those as well. Um, but they really like to settle on old shell because the it's the same chemical composition as the shell that they the, the baby oysters make. Someone just asked, what is your favorite animal and have you ever went underwater? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes we do snorkel and dive for this work. It's very rare. Most of the time we're walking above uh, the mangrove. Sometimes we fall in, um, but we have been underwater. Um, and I guess uh, my favorite animal is, is definitely when we see the sharks um, coming in through. Uh, I don't like to be there if they're too close, but I do like to see them from the boat when we're getting to and from our uh, our field sites. Very cool. And a lot of people have been asking about the waterproof paper. Where do you get <laughs> waterproof paper? How does it work? How do you write underwater with paper? It's actually, so it's called paper, but it's actually made out of plastic. Um, it's made out of a plastic called mylar, the same thing that like silver balloons are made out of. Um, it can be ordered online um, and it's, it's, it's actually really expensive. So um, sometimes these, this paper can cost $1 per sheet of paper uh, sometimes. And wow, so that's cool. valuable. Yeah, we, we have a we have a supplier that that does sell this paper and it's uh, it's specifically designed for applications where you're working outside a lot. Uh, but it can be ordered off like everything. It can be ordered off the Internet. One of the many special tools that help you learn about coastal wetlands and we definitely learned a lot today and appreciated the little video of the field work and learning about all the different research methods. And we thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Savannah.